thing on this. All the group the same as our second. Now, we had someone else post saying they couldn't make it to your second. We just tried to do it this way. Amen. Of course, is at the cross 
Lord. Notice all the things that are going on. The Pharisees are going to be mentioned, the scribes, the thieves, the soldiers, the chief priests. But there was one particular person who came away from there blessed. And I hope tonight you'll leave here having been a person who has certainly been blessed. 27th verse, we'll pick up. And with him, they crucified two thieves, the one on the right hand and the other on the left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said that he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by, that's the first people we see, railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroys the temple and builds it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribe, Ah, he said each other to himself, he, he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend down from the cross, uh -huh, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified him with him, the two thieves, of course, reviled him, he had reviled him mocked him, and scorned him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, behold, he called it Elijah. And one read and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, let alone, let's see whether Elijah will truly come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out, gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight for the joy of being here. Thank you, Lord, for this place. I have gotten blessed so many times. And let me be a blessing to someone tonight. Come help me. Please help me, Lord. I want to say the things that you want me to say. And I know, Father, that you love all of us here tonight. And we just pray that you will experience that love. And tonight when the service is over, that someone would have made the discovery of discoveries. For this I pray in Jesus' beloved, precious, and holy name. Amen. Amen. You see, all the people at the cross, all the religious folks were there. They were criticizing Jesus is dying. He's in the last hours of his life, the last moments of his life. He did not die from the nails in his hands or in his feet. He smothered to death. Those of you who have, I have a friend of mine, he, he has claustrophobia, and any little tight place we get, he has to come out. Jesus hanging on the cross, when he could raise himself up to get a breath, life, stayed in his body, but when you are so weak from all that he has gone through, he was no longer able to do that, and Jesus died on the cross, going through all of the things that he was going through. And we see what all these folks did, the people at the cross, the thieves, the soldiers, chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees, but there was one person, that last verse of scripture, verse 39, and when the centurion, this man, was skilled at killing people, the Roman Empire in those days, they said there was long distances of, of, of road. There'd be been nothing but people hanging on crosses. Some had been hanging there for hours, some of them for days. Because Rome ruled with fear, and they wanted everyone to fear, to know. And this centurion had done it so many, many times. It was, it was a common, everyday thing with him. He was seeing what was going on, and when he saw Jesus dying, he saw the religious people, and he saw the Savior. He saw the sinners the way they would act, and he saw the Savior. He saw the love, the compassion. He saw all of those things that even the other Gospels record. He saw it all. And when the last breath was drawn, here's what he said. Truly, this man was the Son of God. This is the, the Christ, the, the discovery of discoveries is Him. The reason for the discovery, Jesus is never real to us until we discover Him. Right. He's been here forever. Right. 
and he'll be here after I'm gone. We'll be in eternity together. But it is a, it is a thing, this man, this, this man said, this is the son of God, the greatest of inventors. Sir Isaac Newton, when asked one time, what is the greatest thing you have discovered? And he said, Jesus. Amen. The greatest thing you can discover in this life is Jesus and come to know him personally. I remember my baby daughter, Rebecca, we were pastoring up in Ruston and uh, I had a real good garden going that year and I know it might be doing good because the janitor who filled up the baxter said, Brother Oliver, it's a shame. We live right next door. Why drain all this water out of the baxter out in the ground? Why don't you put it in your garden? I put back this water <laughs> on my garden out there. But it was evening time and, and this, the evening, I love right before dark, that quietness that comes over all everything. My wife was hold, holding Rebecca in her arms and she kept, couldn't say, look. She said, yuck, yuck, and clapping on her and she and I was talking about something and she said, yuck, mama, yuck, daddy, yuck, yuck. And finally she said, excuse me, I've got to see what the girl wants. And turned to her and hold her in her arms and said, what is it? And she's pointing up in the sky. You know what she's pointing at? The moon. The moon had been in the sky since the creation of the world, but it wasn't in the sky for Rebecca until she discovered it for the first time herself. Amen. It's a personal discovery that we must do it ourselves. Dear Minister of Music, that we had in South Louisiana, his wife Paula, when they were youth doing ministry in this area, uh, a revival was going on, and a student from Louisiana College was was doing the preaching that night. And I think they were having a different guest that night, and the boy preached, or the young man preached on John three sixteen. She had heard it; she had been in church all her life. She was raised on the church pew, we call it. And when she gave her testimony at our church. She said, John 3.16 was not in the Bible for me until that night. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's been there a long time, folks, but it will never be there until we personally discover it ourselves. It's there for us. Sometimes it can be discovered, it can be discovered through others. Remember, Andrew, whenever Jesus met up with him that day, and he got to thinking about his brother Simon Peter, and he immediately went and they introduced to Jesus, saying first they wanted to see where he lived. Of course, these two men became great, great men, followers of God. Sometimes we find him through other people who help us in our lives, and I don't know about you, but my mom and dad and mom, model Jesus for us every day. I never heard my mom and dad ever have a cross word. They were on the honeymoon the whole time that I ever knew them. Oh, I'm sure the two people who lived together, you're going to disagree sometime. If they did it, they did it in the bedroom. They didn't do it in front of my brother and I. There was no slamming of doors, no raising of voices. There was happiness and gladness in our house, and we got up every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Three finals, WMU. I've been everything in the Baptist church with a GA. <laughs> we, we, that was the way I was raised, and Jesus was everything. We had a piano at the house, and we had a radio that would play it on Saturday night, only to hear the Grand Ole Opry, of course, on the AM was all they had in those days, and it was a, a, a bouncing type signal, and it'd fade in and fade out, but we had a piano. And we'd gather around that piano and sing and sing and sing. All in our house and all that we did was things about Jesus. And I, I thank God that we can come to know through others that great discovery of discoveries that's ours and so it can be done. Some can be discovered through songs. Music has a wonderful way of touching the heart. And it seems like God just made us for music. That when good music is on, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, and my mind went back to Los Angeles, California. I went through high school out there. Can't get into that right now. But anyhow, <laughs> there was a man who, his wife, began to go to the crusade and came to know Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. He liked to honky tonk and do a lot of other things, and she told him she couldn't do that anymore. She wasn't going with him anymore. It made him angry. And before the crusade was over, he learned to hate 
Billy Graham. And one particular night, he was sitting up in the balcony, came in late with a pistol in his coat pocket. He came that night to kill Billy Graham. Oh, George Beverly Shea, that resonant baritone voice that he always has, he'd sing that song, he's got the whole world in his hand, and no one could sing like George Beverly Shea. Amen. And when he got to the chorus, when he would stop singing about having the baby in, in his hands, he said, why, he's got that wee tiny baby right in his hands, up there in the back. Something happened in that man's heart. All of a sudden, things looked different to him. All of a sudden, through just the words of the song, that God even loved little wee tiny babies and has it in his hand. That night, he walked down the aisle openly to profess Jesus Christ as his Savior. He'd been saved in the song service. I was to speak to Billy Graham, and when he came out of the pistol, all, the, all of his entourage <coughs> gathered around the guy. He said, no, no, I came here tonight to use this song, Mr. Graham, but Jesus has changed my life. The song, that word. Some of the songs have so many messages for us if we just listen to what we're singing. We can do it through that. What a wonderful time it is for us. Sometimes it can be through sermons. That's why we preachers preach. I don't get up to do this, and you don't pay me to do this. This is what I do. Sometimes I think if I didn't preach, I'd go back to preaching to the cows, or I just bust wide open. I, these messages start coming, and, 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 and it's like taking dictation. I, sometimes I'll even I'll bring a pad of paper to my bed, and I, I'll wake up here in the night, and I'll turn on the light, and I'll start writing it down. Because if I don't, by morning, I might forget that thing that just blessed my heart. I feel like it blesses me. Hopefully, it'll bless you, too, and you can get something out of it. So it can come through those times and, and this discovery that is there. My grandfather on my mother's side was preacher W.D. Sherwood, one of the greatest preachers during that era. He went to the uh, Church Sardis Baptist Church out in Atlanta. He pastored that church for 17 years and got $7.50. That was back in the old days, folks. They were going to honor him one night. He was getting feeble, not able to get around very much. And so he was feeling pretty good. And they wanted to honor him that night. So all of our family, all the aunts, uncles, grandkids, everybody showed up at the church that night. And the evangelist preached. And the pastor stood to receive. And no one came down the aisle. And he said, Brother Sherwood, can you, can you come up and would you say something to the people tonight? Anything that God would lay on your heart. And I watched him help my grandfather and they had a little kitchen, a little stool for him to sit on. He said, I, I won't need that. I, what I've got to say, I can say it from right where I'm at. He stood behind the pulpit and that old man went to preaching about Jesus. Didn't last probably 15, that was the first time I felt the Lord's touch on my life. He went and turned it over to the pastor, and the pastor said, Folks, we've got to have another invitation. And I remember how folks came down the aisle that night to the pastor praying with them and then receiving Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I saw what God can do through the ministry of that old man who still had love in his heart because God can do that. Then part, part two is to remember, it'll make you different. If you've discovered Jesus, your life is not going to be the same. You cannot go back to the old way of life. You have been set free. You no longer are a captive of Satan. You're no longer the faithful of the, of the roaring lion. You've been set free, and you will do something about what's happened in your life. In that 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, a beautiful passage of Scripture. I do is find it. <laughs> Paul was writing to the church there in, in Corinth. It says, Therefore, 2 Corinthians, you follow me, 5 and 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Amen. And that means nothing like it before. Old things are passed away, and behold, look, all <coughs> things are become new. That old life is no longer a double life if you came to know Jesus. He, he's not a happenstance. He's not something in a storybook, folks. He is a real person who walks with us and talks with us, who's with you 24 hours a day. His promise is, I will never leave you or forsake you. 
For lo, I am with you all the ways, even unto the end of the age. It's there. Your life has changed. Pastoring down in South Louisiana on a New Year's Eve, we had a service at our church and had a lot of things going on that night. And the next morning, I had a couple that came down the aisle, that came to my office and said, Brother Otto, we just, Mernell and I want to talk. And I said, well, Melton, what's going on? He said, well, we were here last night and she and I should have walked the aisle last night. We didn't sleep good. Would you pray with us? Would we give our lives to the Lord today? And we prayed with Melton and Mernell. What a wonderful thrill it was. And you got through it. I will never forget. He said, Preacher, you can depend on us from now on. And how faithful they were in that church. But I'm saying all of this to build it up to this. We rabbit hunted down there a lot with beagles. And so he told me, he said, I'm going to take you beagle, uh, rabbit hunting with my beagles. And I said, I'm, I, I'm anxious to go. He waited two weeks and he said, can you come Saturday morning? I said, yep, I'll be there. So I was there with the shotgun and had everything ready. And he said, now, Brother Oliver, I, I can't promise anything about this month this morning. And I said, Melton, what, what's wrong with the dogs? He said, nothing's wrong with the dogs, but I don't know how they're going to do I said, well, you've hunted everybody in the community knows you got the best dogs. He said, well, since I got saved, I had to change the name of all my dogs. <laughs> the discovery will make you different. I told that same story to about 25 or 30 state troopers and policemen in Livingston, Louisiana. And I'd like to never get got them back together again. I'm glad you appreciate it, and we're, we're going to move on with it. Iris Uria, a lady I met in Texas, spent most of her life in a dark hole in Huntsville Prison. She got out and turned her life on up to the Lord. And I like what she said when she gave her testimony that night in the Jam County Convention Center. She said, I walked out in the middle of that dance floor. The band was my band. The honky tonk was my place. I was ashamed if she said of what I had on. I believe you could say there's more cotton in an aspirin bottle than I had on. And she said, I motioned to the man who had been trying to help me for over a year and asked him to come and pray with me. And she said, I made him all stop and I prayed out there in front of everybody and I prayed, dear Jesus. I know I'm lost. I know I'm a sinner. Please come in my heart and save me right now. Here's the catcher. She said, I knelt a tramp and stood up a lady. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hang on to that for a minute. I knelt a tramp and stood up a lady. The discovery will make you different. You'll not be the same ever again. And lastly, it will demand something of you. The Bible tells us of a man who found a treasure in the field and he went and sold everything for that treasure. Jesus must become your treasure. It must become the thrill of your life. In Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 44 through 46, it tells about a, a man who found a goodly pearl. He was a pearl merchant. No doubt, in the marketplace, he walked by this table and he saw this pearl. It had that warm glow. It had that radiant look to it. He being a pearl merchant knew that he had seen the pearl that he thought he would always one day get to see. And he said to the man, I want that pearl. He said, well, what have you got? Well, he said, I, I have six pearls here in this little bag. He said, join to me. And he emptied them out. He said, okay, six pearls. What else have you got? Well, he said, I got six head of cattle, six, only six, yeah, six head of cattle. What else? Well, I got three horses, three horses. What else? He said, well, that only leaves me with 10 acres and a house, 10 acres and a house. It was his heart. His heart. He had to give everything for the one thing that he knew was the most valuable thing in all of his things that he had as a merchant. 
That's the way it is. It'll demand something of you. Paul writing to the church in Rome had a powerful, powerful thing to say to us. And I'm going to close with this. Romans 12, 1. You know what the word beseech means? I beg you. I, my, my heart's going out to your heart. My heart is pulling at your heart. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, which is holy, acceptable unto God, and which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. What is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? The discovery of discoveries. Have you discovered Jesus? I pray that you will tonight. I want us to have a word of prayer. I don't want to embarrass anybody. This is between you and God. But I know that the members here of our of our staff would be glad to help you. If you want to go to one of them, you probably know them right you know it better than I. And you know them because you've seen them throughout their lives. They'd be glad to pray with you. If you want me to pray with you, it'd be my honor to ask you the initial questions. Are you a sinner? Are you solid for your sins? Are you willing to pray and ask Jesus to forgive you to come into your heart and to save you right now? Would you pray that prayer? That's the way I would do it with you. And you can walk out those doors with the spring in your step. I've made the discovery of discoveries. I have left there bet the answer of my life. My past is gone and my future is gone. Oh, Jesus. Father, I'm thankful for these moments that we have shared together tonight. Yesterday is gone and tomorrow may never come. But we've had this moment together. And if there's someone here tonight who needs to just open up their heart, admit that they've done wrong, and ask you to come into their life. What an invitation to you to come into their life and change their life. I pray, Father, you'll give them the courage to do it. That they'll make up their mind right now. I'm not living another day like I'm living. Tonight it's going to be different. I want my life to be changed. Give them the strength to do it. And we'll rejoice with them because they're free for the first time free in their life. Thank you for the privilege of being here tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And I love all of you. You can't get nothing about it. Yes, sir. Hold up just a minute. Kenny, the son. Share what Kenny will talk to you about. We'll go from there. I talked to Kenny this afternoon. He hadn't been able to be here for several nights, Monday night, because he couldn't work. But he wasn't working tonight. He's not working. He called and said he was really looking forward to coming. But his son, Daniel, you know, he requested prayer for Daniel. Just about every Monday night he's here. And Daniel has had a really bad day. Today. He said, Adrian, I can't leave him in the shape he's in. And so he asked me if I would be anointed for dance that he might be done.
Ghost is mentioned in the Bible. Anointing brings about healing. It is the presence of the Lord. And we're going to pray tonight that the presence of the Lord is in this oil. As I anoint this, my brother, power knows no distance from God. We're going to pray that Daniel, in the bad shape that he's in tonight, will find a warm glow in his heart. And he's going to say to his daddy, Daddy, something wonderful is happening to me. Yes. I, I feel the warmth going all over me, going all the way out to my feet. I, I feel like something powerful. We want him to feel that. So while I'm anointing, we want you two to, to pray for Daniel and for his special needs. And I'm sure that Kenny asked this tonight because he said that there's desperation in this place that it be done. <coughs> Thank you for hearing my prayer in Jesus' lovely name. 